Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Kenan's Cutting Edge, where we discuss all things edge. My name is Jenna Labore, and I will be your host as we explore the dynamic world of Don Kenan's trial philosophy, the cutting edge. Those of you joining us live this afternoon are receiving early bird access to this episode. You have the opportunity to ask questions and interact with our speakers. If you have a question, please type it into the comment section below, and we will be sure to address it. If you happen to be unable to join us live or have someone you want to share this episode with, episodes are released each week following the live broadcast. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and click the alerts icon to make sure you don't miss an episode. Today, we have with us Devin McNulty and Troy Chandler for our Superstar series. As you all know by now, Papa Don loves to honor anyone who has a stellar outcome at trial using the cutting edge techniques by giving them a platform to share how the edge brought them to victory. Devin and Troy represent victims of all kinds of personal injuries from catastrophic medical devices to mesothelioma and asbestos and everything in between out of Texas. So we'll put a link to their website as well as their contact information in the description below so that you can reach out to them directly with any questions after this episode. Now we had a preview from Papa Don about this trial result during our New Year's Eve episode. So I am excited to hear more about it today. Devin and Troy, tell us how you used edge techniques to achieve justice for your client. Hey, thanks very much, Jenna. So I remember doing a reptile seminar in the same year we did the David Ball Damages seminar probably about 10 years ago and said, man, I wish I had the first 10 years of my practice back because as I look back on trials that I had lost, I thought, man, how I could have been saved if I had just used these what are common sense to some degree techniques. So we are big, and ever since then, we've been big fans and big advocates of, of Don Keenan's strategy and David Ball's and, and Rules of the Road that everybody here listening is going to be familiar with. And th in fact, I think the same year I took the Rules of the Road and David Ball at the same seminar too, so, along with Don Keenan. So all since then, all of our trials have been couched that way. And since then, we haven't lost a case. Um, so, you know, it works. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the case that Devin and I tried. The verdict was rendered on October 15th against FedEx Freight. We represented two men ages at the time of trial, 43 and 40, um, Jack and Andy Cargill. We did not represent the widow or the estate. This was a wrongful death case in which our client, an 18-wheeler driver for XPO, was killed when a FedEx freight truck crossed the center line on a dark highway at night in the rain, hit him head on, and he was killed. The widow in the estate settled out of the case about 90 days or so after filing, but FedEx freight never took the claims of our adult children seriously. They offered them settlements that were insulting and did not represent the true harms and losses suffered by Jack and Andy. So we never got close to uh, settling the case. And all throughout trial, they were offering, you know, making offers. And up until the day the verdict was rendered, still never took it seriously because they just kept saying, our verdict research indicates that adult children are worth X. And we said, you're not evaluating the individual facts of this case. And as we go through it, You'll understand what I mean about why this wasn't a typical adult children who lost their 68-year-old uh, father. Um, so let me share my screen here with you and go through a brief PowerPoint that I've prepared just to get you familiar with the case and some of the factors that helped us uh, win it. So first of all, um, this is our emails, Troy and Devin, that's our law firm. If you email me after this and you want anything in our materials and you are a, an advocate or lawyer who represents victims of corporate negligence, everything we have is yours. We've opened up our file to anybody in that category. If you're an insurance defense lawyer or an insurance representative, you can pound sand and fish through the files yourself uh, at the county courthouse. 
Um, I want to offer everybody who is also a plaintiff's lawyer this. You see that Making America Safer tagline? We've trademarked it. I only trademarked it so somebody couldn't tell me I couldn't use it. But if you want to use it for one dollar, I'll license it to you because I want every plaintiff's lawyer in the country to use that tagline because it's truly what we do. And we we trademarked it long before and started using it long before another guy started using a similar phrase and and started ruining the country. So that's not where we got it. In a, if you email me, you're going to get a Dropbox link to at least this much material. The opening PowerPoint that we used in our case, this PowerPoint and all the reference material and videos, depositions in it, you'll get the discovery in our case, including all the depositions, the interrogatories, the exhibits assigned, uh, attached to it. You'll get the pleadings, including our responses to the motions filed by defendant to strike every single expert we had in the case the PowerPoint with the relevant case law and exhibits we used at the hearing to defeat every single one of them, all of the exhibits to them, the petition in the case, and anything else that you want in the file. We're lucky because this case went to verdict, so there is no confidentiality of any of the exhibits or any of the discovery material. It's all a matter of public record. Uh, that's what happens, defendants, when you don't settle cases. We want to thank our partners in the case, the people that we really looked to and helped us out a lot in getting this verdict. First and foremost, um, even though uh, we, we are not great friends and don't go to dinner, David Ball and Don Keenan, whose, whose methods and books that we've used time and time again and did in this trial uh, to great success. So I strongly encourage those of you who haven't already to uh, pick this book up and read it seven times. Another great consultant who we've used for the last about 12 years on every case uh, is Robert Bailey with Trial by Design. He's incredible. He, he helps you storyboard your opening such that by the time you're done with it, in my opinion, the case is over. Another great consultant who we used on this case is uh, Paul Luttrell with Strategic. If you've ever wanted to find a whistleblower in your case and thought, man, I just wish I had a manager who used to work for this defendant and uh, I wish I could find him. Well, this company does that very thing and they do it very well. We've used them in three different cases and they have found us what we call silver bullet witnesses in every case, including this one. Uh, so, and they're just fabulous. Finally, my good friend, who I think is the best investigator in the country, Scott Cervenka, who during the middle of trial found surprise witnesses, the defendant popped up on the first Friday after the first week of trial and said, they'll be coming next week, even though they'd never been disclosed. And uh, by Friday at 6 p.m., Scott had their name, address, and cell phone number for me, and we were contacting these witnesses. And without you know, the big team effort, nothing like this is possible. So let me start with the case, Cargill versus FedEx, and, you know, we always start with the rule that affects everybody, that, that brings it home to them. It was a case about safety on the roads. And I'll just do a brief introduction that Robert and I did together and Devin on this case to get you a feel for it. So let me take you back in time. It's September 8th, 2018. Trooper Taylor Buster is on duty and he's received a phone call about a tragic wreck. He's outside of Tannehill, Texas, which is between Shreveport and Houston in Northeast Texas. He arrives on the scene to find that the road is wet, it's been raining, visibility is extremely limited, and it's a very dark stretch of unilluminated road. And he finds an XBO truck and a FedEx truck have had a head-on collision, and one of the drivers is dead. So that's the way we start our every trial with setting the mood and starting a story and kind of staging what we call the movie. We show our case. Um, this is the book, which is a paint by numbers way to do that very thing. What Robert Bailey and, and Don and, and David Ball will all tell you is that images speak to a the center of a person's decision-making process uh, where those decisions are really made. You know, we make our decisions um, in large part on logic, but 
on our heart and our gut. And that's where the exhibits that are admissible and relevant and entirely appropriate, they speak to that center of a person. So for example, this slide is our vehicle inspection of the truck involved from FedEx. So we can tell the jury that we inspected the evidence in this case and got to the truck. But if we show them the process, here's our trooper right there. This is my law partner, Devin. We're at the scene and we're going through it and we're showing it to them. This is an example of what I mean. It's from another case, but it's the wife of a client we represented who had mesothelioma. And I wanted to drive home the point of how concerned the whole family was. So we went to the hospital the day of the surgery and we documented the evidence. If I tell you Mrs. Phillips was concerned about her husband in the hospital and, every, and all the family was there praying and, and waiting for him to come out successfully, that might communicate something to you. But if I show you this image and I don't see anything, even though we're advocates who make our livings with our words, I can't communicate this. I'm not that good. But if I show this, it'll drive home the point. And so that's everything we do in our trial. We do it for that reason. I mean, you know, we're all just, unfortunately, everybody who learns, we do it with technology. We do it from the time we're born. This is a new age. And every good teacher from kindergarten to professor to lawyer should be doing it and abandoning the old techniques. We need to be as much a Don Keenan and a Jerry Spence, but also this guy. And so that's the point of these openings. I'm gonna show you um, a key piece of evidence just so you get an idea of what happened. This is the dash cam video from the FedEx truck. Uh, it captured 30 seconds before the crash and it captured 15 minutes before the crash, but for some reason uploaded them to the cloud in two separate videos. You won't be surprised when I tell you that the FedEx lawyer told us everything burnt up in the crash and it wasn't available. Thank goodness we had a Texas trooper who took custody of the truck, got a search warrant and, and secured the truck so that nobody could touch it until everybody was ready to inspect it. So we got our crash reconstructionist in there and he downloaded the data and what do you know, it was saved in spite of what FedEx said. And so this is the last 30 seconds from the point of view of the FedEx driver as he's driving down the road. You see the car in front of him with the taillights. It's very dark. There's no overhead street lights or anything. In a moment, you'll see the brake lights come on in front of him and you'll notice what the FedEx driver does in response to the brake lights coming on. There they are. Now, it's about six seconds before he understands why the brake lights are on. And there it was. It's an obstruction in the road. It's a downed tree, according to FedEx. And even the DPS trooper who put in his report, that's a tree. When I said, you'll see what he does in response to the brake lights, the answer was nothing. In fact, when the brake lights go went on, to the time he went, got to the tree in the road, the driver had sped up, not slowed down in spite of all the rules of the road that tell drivers when you see brake lights, you need to slow down. So that's the only video that was available from the FedEx point of view. However, we did also capture the last nine seconds from the XBO truck. It uploaded to the cloud the last nine seconds and the XBO truck, which was 50, years older than the FedEx freight truck was outfitted retrofitted with onboard dash cameras outboard and inboard so we get to see the driver this is the perspective of what our driver saw our client Joseph Cargill what he saw coming at him those headlights are the cars the car you saw with the brake lights and then the truck behind him so we'll start this And that's the FedEx truck crossing the center line. Now, of course, this defendant blamed our client. They just do it reflexively. They cannot help themselves. It was our client's fault. They had a contributory negligence claim. This 
onboard dash camera every responsible trucking company who cares about the safety on the roads and their own drivers should have a driver facing dash camera because this dashboard camera facing the driver proved that their own driver did nothing wrong so here's the last nine seconds of joseph cargill's life Joseph Cargill was at 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, not distracted, doing everything right in spite of the baseless allegations of FedEx freight. What you saw on the road is this small sapling tree, whatever you want to call it. We, I'll tell you briefly why we thought about that throughout the trial, but that's what it was. It was a tiny tree that got blown over in the storm and was covering the road. That on the ground is the part that they cut off from those freshly cut branches, drugged to the side of the road and threw on the ground. The trooper called it a tree in his report. And so FedEx kept calling it a tree as if it was a redwood that was an impenetrable barrier across the road. And of course, any driver who suddenly came upon this would panic and cross the center line. Uh, that was countered by this guy who FedEx sent out on the scene, their regional manager, whose deposition we took, because it's always important to, number one, go to the scene. During this case, I rented an 18-wheeler, got in the passenger seat, and had him drive me the route from Houston to Shreveport and back so I could see the perspective of both of these drivers. Well, this is the guy who was on the scene the morning of, and this is what he said about what was covering the road. Would you agree then that the part that was cut off appears in exhibit number three and that you would characterize that as a branch, Mr. Perla? It's a branch. Now, whether it's a branch or a tree at the moment the driver runs over it is more, it's not as relevant as what it says about the defendant's credibility during trial who insisted that it was this impenetrable bl blockade of the road. And we made an issue out of it, not because we faulted the driver for his reaction to it, whether it was a tree or a branch, but because the defense lawyer was lying every time he said it was a tree and he knew it. So it affected their credibility more than anything by sticking with the story their own guy told them wasn't true. Um, so one, one of the things I told you we're going to get are the expert motions. If you email me, um, here are the responses to every expert that we had that they filed motions to strike on. One of the big issues was how fast was the FedEx driver going? The speed limit was 55. The driver was going 65. Everybody who does trucking cases knows under conditions of limited visibility and wet roads, you have to exercise extreme caution pursuant to 392.14 of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. So the speed limit, the actual safe speed limit was under 55 because 55 was a maximum. But because we were operating under extreme conditions, he should have been going something under 45. By the way, our driver was. Theirs wasn't. But the way we calculated the speed, because a lot of the data on the ECMs, the electronic control modules, was spoiled. So the way we calculated it was by the videos and counting the lines in the road. And one of the things they filed this motion to strike on was on that analysis. And so you will get an expert response that survived a Daubert scrutiny on how to calculate speed by video and all of the exhibits and, and, and resources to it. Roger Allen, our trucking standard of care guy, came in to talk about the standard of the industry with respect to video and the equipment on the trucks, and they filed motions to strike that. Here's FedEx's own corporate rep's testimony. They admit under oath that dashboard cameras and driver-facing cameras are safety devices. They go on to say that these safety devices make their drivers behave and drive more safely on the road because they're watched. Of course, that makes sense, but that was a big deal to FedEx and they wanted to keep it out. We survived that. Another thing they wanted to strike was the trooper's opinion who put the fault on FedEx. Of course, uh, they back the blue when they want to, but not when they don't, when their opinions are bad for them. 
It was very clear to the trooper and everybody else who came on the scene that it was FedEx's fault. And one of the reasons is they didn't have the safety devices on their trucks that make the highway safer for the public. You know, th you, this is gonna start sounding familiar to the edge folks. These aren't just random pieces of equipment that aren't important because the ultimate outcome is they make us all safer. Um, and of course, these are all the rules of the road that uh, help us prove that cameras and other things we said the driver should have been doing make us all safer, not just them. It helps when you have a defense lawyer who ignores um, regulations. For example, the defendant in the case argued that 392.14 didn't apply because uh, it's not really limited visibility at night. This is Bill Chambly of the law firm of Chambly Ryan, who represented FedEx Freight in the case. And he, with a straight face, argued, well, 392.14 doesn't apply because this was not a situation of limited visibility. On the left, you see the night view. That's what we were operating under that night. On the right, you see the same road during the day. Their argument with a straight face was, that's not limited visibility. And therefore, 392.14 didn't apply, and therefore, we weren't speeding. They hung their hat on that. Um, I'll go, th an another defense was act of God because they said the tree was blown over in the road by the wind, and that's God doing it. We made quick work of that because under the law in Texas, it cannot have been foreseeable or partly contributed to by the negligence of the defendant. And this is what FedEx's safety guy talked about with respect to obstructions in the road after a storm and why the jury made very quick work of act of God, as they did in our focus groups, by the way. Let me show you, Mr. Vargas. Have you ever heard that a professional driver always has to have an out? Yes. What does that mean? Basically, you want to do your best as a driver to uh, ensure if anything happens that you leave yourself an out, uh, but basically uh, somewhat of an escape route, I guess. So a professional driver is required to be scanning the road for hazards at all times. Fair enough? Yes. And road debris in the piney woods of East Texas after a storm, that might even be more common, right? Yeah. You've probably seen that yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a professional driver has to be prepared for road debris in the road. That's just something that's part of his escape plan thinking. Fair enough? That's fair enough. Now you'll notice that's a Zoom depot. Have you ever heard and that? A what I want to tell everybody is most of the videos in this case were taken by Zoom because of COVID protocols, um, at least 80% of them. Don't be afraid of Zoom depositions. They are outstanding and they can be highly effective. I prefer them actually over being in person. Don't be afraid of them. Uh, this is David Forehand. He was one of our biggest concerns in the case because in spite of the overwhelming negligence that he contributed that night, in spite of all of that, um, he came off as a very soft-spoken, mild-mannered, uh, Santa Claus-looking man, as you see there. I mean, we were very concerned about them, but because the black hats don't know what to do and can't help themselves, they got their client to take positions that couldn't possibly be reasonable. For example, even though I was speeding in the rain, didn't slow down for brake lights, and I crossed the center line, I don't think I did anything wrong. So this etern they, the defense lawyers in this case turned what could have been a very sympathetic defendant into somebody who was just not credible. I don't believe Mr. Forehand believed that, but I do believe FedEx Freight pressured him to say it. Here's some of his testimony that Devin on cross-examination got out of him. Devin tends to cross-examine folks who are soft and mild-mannered because I come across sometimes too um, not mild-mannered, let's say. So Devin handles this guy with kid gloves, and he really got some great admissions out of him, for example, not being, not leaving him an option out because he was speeding, um, crossing the center line. That wasn't an out, that kind of thing. Another thing he testified to was that the way he was trained to keep a safe distance from the car in front of him was to wait until his emergency alarm on his dashboard went off, telling him he was too close, and then he would back off. 
the week before trial, I went to a seminar because it's the uh, Academy of Trucking Accident Attorneys, which is an outstanding organization. If you do trucking cases and don't belong to it, you should. And this was the week before trial, even though we were in the midst of trial preparation and busy 20 hours a day, I thought I might learn something there that I can use. And this is an example of something I learned that is very along the lines of the edge and, and the rules of the road. In every single case, you're going to have, if it's a case worth filing, violations of safety standards. In our case, it was at least the five that I you see on the screen. And we went through with Mr. Bailey there. Sorry for those alerts. We went through with Mr. Bailey all of these things that their driver did and asked him to give us a grade. This was live on the stand during cross-examination. And ultimately, he agreed his driver failed to do every one of those. Um, and the grade that he would give him would be an F. Nevertheless, Chambly Ryan lawyer argued in, in the face of an F that they were, their driver did nothing wrong and they wouldn't change a thing. You know, that kind of thing is a gift uh, to, a, to a plaintiff's lawyer. I want to tell you about one more guy. If you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you will see him. He's a human factors PhD, Dr. Manuel Mesa Arroyo. He helped us because he would not agree that a truck weighs more than a passenger car. Can you believe it? And therefore, they had to react differently and do things differently. If, if and when you see this PhD, call me, email me. I have the book on him. And Devin and I made a conscious decision not to strike his outrageous and frivolous and unsupported scientific opinions because they were so outrageous and unsupportable. And we wanted FedEx Freight to sponsor that garbage. And they did, and they did it with a straight face, and it backfired. Now, let's talk about why adult children of a 68-year-old father who were very well adjusted and making a decent living and with good families can have harms and losses that do, in fact, support a $30 million verdict in spite of FedEx Freight's disrespect for the value of life. Jack and Andy Cargill grew up with their father uh, from the time they were young boys, ages um, 13 and 10, I believe, without looking. Their mother left home. Um, they felt abandoned. Their father stepped up and became Superman. He was, he became super father. He raised them from that point by himself, took additional jobs, to raise him and he was their everything. They testified that when you killed our father, you made us orphans. We do not have a relationship with our mother. Um, and our father was everything to us. In spite of that kind of testimony, FedEx evaluated this case as a traditional loss of a, an adult parent in his late 60s. They just could not bring themselves to consider the individual circumstances. But the better part is we showed this. We walked them through the story, how they had been told what happened, the emotions they were going through. And we started from the funeral and worked our way back, but we didn't talk about it again. We showed them these, this is relevant, this discoverable evidence, and it is admissible. There's nothing wrong with showing this. Um, and you should in every case. If you're going to talk about a funeral, you should show it because it's evidence and it's admissible. They went through how everybody at the funeral had t-shirts with their father's name on all these XPO drivers who showed up. So we started at the beginning of their life in uh, Indianapolis when they were born and how the dad was in the room when the boys were born. And how they moved to Houston at a certain time where we met them. And we walked them through the story. The ca a case is about what you focus on. In our case, it was about the harms and losses to these boys. This was his second job Mr. Cargill took after his wife left so he could support the boys. And we walked them through the harms and the losses, what the real case is about, and ultimately proved that's Joseph, his grandchild named after him. Um, and his, uh, that's Jack Cargill and his family. But we took him through how great a grandfather he was and how he was about to retire. His son moved to Utah. And FedEx said, your son doesn't even live in the same city. You never see him. Well, they forget that we have 
FaceTime and phone calls and videos we can share back and forth. And the family did it. The family talked about the, the, um, the acts of kindness that they would do in Jay's name. And we would show them that. We took them to the last time that Andy there on the left saw his father at his grandmother's funeral, Joseph's mom when he died. This is Joseph's family. There are 10 children. Joseph Cargill is the only one of 10 who passed away. His oldest brother is five years older. His youngest sibling is, is more than five years younger. They're all in perfect health. But we can't just say that. We showed them the family and where Joseph was in the birth order and how they're all still alive. We showed them the time, the, you know, the life care tables, et cetera, and why it would support the kind of a harms and loss because Mr. Cargill had 20 more years with his boys had he had FedEx not taken him. This is the wall on Andy Cargill's home, which is a shrine to his father. We can't just talk about it. We went to their homes, took photos of it, and showed it to him. So when you ask how can adult children's case support a $30 million verdict, it's because we showed the harms and the losses. This is a teddy bear made out of the t-shirts their dad used to wear that their children sleep with now. So that's what the case was about. Let me stop sharing and get back on the video with you and uh, let Devin comment on, on what I missed and then open it up to any questions because I've used about half our time. Go ahead, Devin. So there was tremendous obstruction from the defense in this case, and, and Troy sort of touched on it with um, the fight about whether or not nighttime reduces visibility. The defendants had objected to every single witness, every single exhibit, and virtually every single piece of proffered testimony. And so that's something that we had to fight about. And I think it was really distilled, the obstructionist was really distilled with our day-long fight in court about whether or not it's harder to see at nighttime than it is during the day. But despite all of that, early in my career, I was a prosecutor, and I watched hours and hours of DUI footage. And as soon as I saw the dash cam video in this case, I thought the FedEx driver is distracted. There's for some reason, he's not paying attention. I don't know why. We'll never know why. But he looked up at the last minute and saw a shadow in front of him. And so he jerked his wheel to the left. And so when you have video in a case, obviously, I think it's axiomatic that it's your best witness. But I think it's probably your 10 best witnesses. Because whoever you have live testifying, the jury is going to go back to the video anyway. And so I think every person takes a back seat to what you have on video, because the jurors will make up their own mind and have their own theories about it. So having the video in this case, I thought was, was obviously crucial, but I wonder what it would have been like without video in this case and trying to figure out and make our case without it and, and speculating about what happened or what didn't happen. Maybe it would be the same result. Maybe it would be you know a, a greater verdict or not. You know We'll never know. But as soon as I saw that video, my unshakable belief from the very beginning to today was the driver was doing something in the cab that took his attention off the road. He didn't respond to the brake lights of the vehicle in front of him. And his reaction to something that was a, a minor nuisance to the front of his cab. I mean, he was 80,000 pounds. He could have steamrolled over the branch or tree without effect. And, um, you know, that video, I thought, you know, we pulled the jurors afterwards about what they what they reacted to it, what they thought. And, you know, all 12 of them obviously have different ideas, but it, it to me was the linchpin exhibit and and something that I, as soon as I saw it, I, I knew we had a strong case. Which is probably why FedEx denied its existence until our crash reconstructionist and the DPS got to you know, determine for themselves whether it existed. And the lack of a driver facing camera will leave you to conclude why FedEx Freight wouldn't want that when their competitors like XPO in our case and many others, it's, it's, it's fast becoming if it's not already the standard of the industry to have driver facing cameras. 
I've always said it, it, it has been the standard in the industry to have outward facing cameras for some time, but driver facing cameras, in my opinion, is now at least for companies the size of FedEx and XPO, the standard, or it should be because they have an obligation to supervise their drivers. Well, how do you supervise 34,000 drivers that FedEx has on the road? You can't put a supervisor in every cab. Well, you can re in real time, watch them behind the wheel, much like you would watch any other employee under your in an office setting. You have an obligation to supervise and make a safe place to work. It can be done. It can be done cheaply. FedEx Freight to this very day just refuses to do it. So uh, having said all that, Jenna, do you got any questions for us? Anybody have anything they want to know? So far, we don't have anything from the audience, but I have a few questions for you guys yeah. if you want to spend some time chatting. Please. Um, did did When you talk to the jury afterwards, and I know there's a lot of mixed thoughts and feelings about whether you talk to the jury. And if you do, how do you take their input or whatever? But what did they think about that tree versus branch distinction? Did they feel like that was a lie from the defense or is that something that you guys felt um, just well, on your own? We did, we, we thought it was a lie and so did they. they. They made very quick work of the fact that the branch posed any risk to this driver because their response, their answer to the branch was, he could have killed himself if he drove over it. It would have caused his truck to get out of control and he would have um, you know, ran into the trees on the side of the road. Where our answer was, you do go to the right, by the way. You do go to the, uh, the shoulder. That's what you're supposed to do. I'll tell you this. It was an 11 to 1 verdict. It was not unanimous. The holdout didn't think we were asking for enough. We asked for $30 million. That's what they gave us. The holdout wanted to give 45. Hmm. Um, so, and, and it's always a good sign when, when number one, whenever we win a case like this, I want to get the heck out of there because I know the defense is looking for a way to take your verdict away. They're trying to find jury misconduct. We wanted to get the heck out of the courthouse and go home because mission accomplished. But the defendants were pouncing on them outside the courtroom, waiting for them to come out. So we stayed there and we told them in no uncertain circumstances after they got done hugging our clients when they came out, it's always a good sign. Yeah. We told them in front of the defense lawyers under no uncertain terms, if you are asked to sign an affidavit, you are free to do it. But the reason they will ask you to do it is they want to take this away. They are trying to find something you did that violated the court's instructions. That's why they're asking you these questions, folks. And that's why they would ask you to sign anything. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling the jury that I, we told them we will not ask you to do that. You've done your job. We thank you for your service. But the defendant will now start a three-year-long process of trying to undo everything you did to make the road safer today. So I have no problem telling them that. And we did right in front of the defense lawyer, who did not deny it, by the way. And has that begun, the three-year process, or maybe even many more years? Well, the, the motions for new trial are pending uh, or, or still, and everything still to be argued and, and the appeal will start. But we feel pretty, we feel very strongly about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reason we stayed to talk to them was because the defense was there and yeah. the defense was there with their appellate counsel. You know, I mean, one of the first questions out of the mouth that I overheard was, you know, the jury charge was really confusing, wasn't it? You know, and... And I just to even argue that point, I, I get so confused when I read through jury charges. Like that's it's ridiculous that we ask people to even. I, I feel like, hey, anyways, but yeah, I mean, I agree with them on that point. But at the same time, that's what we've decided they're supposed to use as the rules, right? That's right. That's right. And just to draw a distinction, it was twelve zero on liability in the case and eleven to one on damages. So I mean, liability was totally unanimous. I mean, there was no no dissent there at all. Yeah. Thank you for the distinction. That's important. Another thing that we talk about a lot in Edge and Tony Seaton beat me to the punch here are focus groups. And I, I segue here because of our discussion on jury charges and what we often talk about in Edge as bubble law, right? Because even though those jury charges are really confusing, we walk into trial having done focus groups and knowing it doesn't matter because Bubba has their idea of what the law is, what should be done, what should not be done, and that's how they're going to make their decision, right? So how did you use focus groups in this case? I know you mentioned them. And I hold on, how did you use focus groups? And how many did you do? So we did um, one formal focus group, and then um, 
and then they're informal with our colleagues here. In, so we did two, one very formal one with a great jury consultant named Karen Hurwitz here in town. And then the Houston trial lawyers have a program where you can come and bring your case and pitch them to your trial lawyer friends who will focus it with you. So we did it there as well. What we learned in the second one with our trial lawyer colleagues was we weren't asking for enough money. Um, and what we learned in the first one, which was hugely important to us because it gave me some comfort, even though we lost the argument on the jury charge, we felt very strongly and due to this day that the admission of an act of God instruction was error because in Texas, an act of God can only be the instruction if it is unforeseeable and the negligence of the defendant did not contribute. In our case, we had very strong testimony that obstructions in the road after a storm are very foreseeable. In fact, it's in FedEx Freight's own manual to look for it. The, and we had very good evidence that the driver committed negligence that contributed to the crash. So we thought very strongly it shouldn't be admitted. It was ultimately in the jury charge, but at the focus group, the, the jury made very quick work of it. Mm -hmm. We were very concerned that they would hang on that, but like the like in our focus group, our real jury considered it, looked at the evidence and said, no way. And so the focus group gave us some comfort that that would happen if we lost that instruction. And, you know, having lost the instruction, it takes an appeal point away. So you know, more, more power to you. You got what you asked for. And the jury did exactly what our focus group did. And it gave us some comfort. The other thing the focus, the first focus group did is it gave us an inkling that we might be not asking for enough because there were a great number of jurors who offered or, or thought that the harms and the losses represented more than the 10 million we asked for at the focus group. But there were some others who thought it was less. But like all focus groups, we slanted it towards the defense and they didn't see our best evidence. Um, mm -hmm. We always do that, as you should. So we felt at trial, when they see the really good stuff, they're probably going to um, consider the harms and the losses greater. Like mm -hmm. some of the testimony about the sons and the, and the impact on them, that kind of thing. Yeah, you really you can't, you can't, you can't think about trying any kind of high dollar case without focus grouping it because Jenna, like you said, I mean, the, the bubble law is the supreme law of the land. You know, it, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter, but it, what, what the jury charge says so much as what is in line with the normative beliefs of the jury. I mean, what makes sense and what makes sense on a, on a consensus basis. And so there's no way of, of finding that out, you know, without focus grouping. And that's, that's something that, you know, edge really, really drills into you from the start. And even seeing, you know, in, in Don Keenan's office, he's got, I think it was, he called, he renamed it one of his conference rooms, the AIG room, at least he was telling us that at the time. And, you know, the little mock courtroom he's got. And yeah, I mean, all of that is what you learn so much about your case and what is important and what's not. Because oftentimes when you're living your case and living it for years, you become, uh, I don't know, you, you overthink um, certain aspects of it and put way too much value on some things and too little value on others. And so focus grouping, it really helps put it into a sharper focus. Mm -hmm. You cannot predict everything. You don't know everything. And good lawyers know they don't know everything. And a focus group will tell you what normal folks who don't have a law school lobotomy think about your case. And, you, and I would never consider going to trial on a potential seven or eight figure case without having done at least one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent points. And we all have heard the phrase, if you're explaining, you're losing, right? So you, you have a bunch of confusing things like jury charges that have seven words where there only needs to be one and whatnot. It's like, let's not explain that. Let's walk into this with being empowered to know that we know what Bubba thinks already. We know what the jurors are already thinking. So let's play to those strengths and get this done, right? All right. So let's see. Oh, I had a question. I was curious if you had any claims against the state or the county, because that road seemed just obscenely dangerous with no lighting at all whatsoever. We've got highways out here that stretch for miles, but it's got lighting. I don't know. No, that, that it's a very, very country part of um, 
of the state, Northeast Texas, about an hour from the Louisiana border. Uh, the short answer is because of immunity and damage caps anyway in Texas, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been worth pursuing. And um, so, you know, we went with the strongest case we had, which was easily against FedEx, and then we concentrated on that. It would have been too complicated and would have distracted and wouldn't have resulted in additional recovery given damage caps anyway against the state. That makes sense. All right. Yeah, and that's another good point, too, is keep it simple, right? That's another big edge block. Like, what, you know, Devin and I have had cases where we legitimately are entitled to lawyer fees. Um, and rather than add an additional factor in our case where we would have to testify, where we would be asking the jury for money for us, you know, we've abandoned those and thought in the grand scheme of things, uh, our attorney's fees are less than the true harm and loss, which is the loss of the person here and um, just left it to the jury to evaluate that appropriately. So if you can make it simpler and abandon the claim, I don't believe you lose anything or, or take anything off the table. I think you add to it. So sometimes simpler will yield a better result anyway. Absolutely. Um, with the driver, you talked about how he seemed, he appeared like he might be a really nice guy. And then he ended up towing the line for the company. Now we've heard Papa Don talk a lot about making the driver the victim as well. If they do turn out to be um, a really nice person. How, what was your strategy going into that deposition? What did you know about him? And how did you use that as you went through that deposition and discovered who he was and what position he was going to take? I, I couldn't agree more with making the driver the victim. He just wouldn't let us. Uh, you know, we gave him every opportunity to testify about how providing additional safety devices would have made him a safer driver, how paying him by the hour for example, he's paid by the trip. So the faster he gets there and back, the more money he makes. Um, and we gave him every opportunity to say, if you know, paying by the hour would allow me to slow down, to take things easier rather than the pressure. And by the way, remember it's FedEx, so they're always under a time pressure rather than the time pressure. And we gave him every opportunity in the world, but you know, sometimes they're just woodshedded to the point where they're scared. And that never works out for the defendant, by the way. It never does. And in our case, he came to do his deposition, ready to pull the party line, and he stuck with it throughout trial. And ultimately, what could have been a very sympathetic grandpa Santa Claus looking driver um, turned out to be a dangerous person on the road because the defendants, I'm convinced, scared him and told him, for example, in his deposition, he didn't know whether he still had a job. He didn't know whether he was still employed by FedEx. What he did know is his medical bills were being paid by the insurance company. And I convinced, even though he didn't admit it, he was afraid if he didn't tow the party line, his insurance would be cut off and he'd be kicked to the street because he need, he was devastatingly hurt. He was in the hospital for two months himself. Mm -hmm. um, and then when he got to trial, because he was so scared, Devin took him through some things that he could have easily been reasonable about. And because he wasn't, it probably added to a greater verdict because he now he's a menace right yeah well also me it shows that there's not enough remorse that you're going to change your ways right so then he's the next victim right, right? Yeah. definitely what uh edge colleges or seminars would you recommend people attending so that they can learn what you guys learn to use in in this case what's on the list have I you done all of them what have you guys done where are you in your edge journey um, so We've done focus groups and cross-examination, I believe, and the damages, I think. Sounds right. My, my first introduction was back in the reptile days when and Don Keenan came to Houston and he did a, a seminar, which was the second one I did. I think the first one was in Santa Fe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Before but, my time, folks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, folks, it really is a practice-changing education if you're not doing it um you're leaving you're leaving money on the table for your clients you're losing cases you should be winning because boy i look back on my first 10 years and go god i could have won that case uh, do you have other lawyers at your firm that you send to these types of colleges or teach or you guys is it just the two of you or how does that work it's just it's just the two of us at our law firm however i went to these colleges when i worked for another firm who believed in supporting the training and the advocacy of their lawyers mm -hmm. so we, i was very lucky 
Um, you know, and I'll give him a shout out. Williams Hart here in Houston, Johnny Williams was a, a very generous boss and he sent us to everything we could uh, because ultimately it helped, you know, helped his bottom line too, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you are a member of a big firm or you own a big firm, um, it, it's tremendously short-sighted to not educate your lawyers that are out there working, trying to get you and your clients uh, money. So, you know, we, we had, we're very fortunate to work for a boss who really believed in, in education through a number of different providers. And, you know, my first couple of years working there, I think I had 40 plus CLE hours each year. I mean, it was a, a real commitment to it, not just, you know, whatever your state, you know, minimum is, but it was, you know, multiples of that. And it really sets your career on the right trajectory and ingrains in you from the start how important it is that there are lawyers out there that are, are better than you with better ideas and to work and see what style works because ultimately, you know, your water, your personality has to find its own level and you have to be yourself and you can't, you can't imitate, you can't be a, a poor copy of, of someone else because it's inauthentic. So uh, being exposed to a number of great trial lawyers through different education is is so critical to a young career and, and it just makes you a better lawyer it's, you get better depot testimony you know yeah yeah one thing to keep in mind as well if any people who are parts of big firms or own big firms here we're listening is that you might be the partner who tries the case but whoever whatever associates are doing discovery these colleges teach you about how to take a deposition how to, what evidence to gather, how to put it together. I mean, we now have a seeing is believing course for things like you were talking about the Robert Bailey book, how to show what you're talking about. So even if you're like, well, I don't need that for trial because I've been doing this forever, get yourself set up, right? All, all along the way to have the right stuff to present in front of your jury. Good, good depositions will prevent a trial. I mean, that's, so. that's where the case is made, folks. And, and a lot of you were sending your associates to do them. If they're not doing it this way and they don't have the training, what are you getting as your final product when you get to trial? Because by then it's too late. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Devin and Troy, for being here with us today. And thank you to all of you who joined us for this week's episode of Fridays with Keenan's Cutting Edge. If you liked today's video, please click that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and sign up for alerts so you don't miss an episode. Next week, we'll be hearing from Elizabeth Larrick, who will talk to us about preparing our clients for testimony in deposition and trial. I'm sure we all recall a time where we spent the last 15 or 30 minutes right before the deposition telling our clients, tell the truth, listen to the question, and answer only the question. Well, those days will be long behind you if they aren't already when you hear about the effectiveness of witness prep the edge way. And Liz has a national reputation for being the best at it. I look forward to learning from Liz along with all of you. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you next time. Thanks, Jenna.